Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. We're bringing you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. I'm your host, Stephanie McGrath, and the Publisher Operations Specialist here at Kobo Writing Life. And I'm Tara Kremen, the Author Experience Manager for Kobo Writing Life. So this week we're talking to Darcy Burke, and Darcy Burke is the U.S. Today bestselling author of sexy, emotional, historical, and contemporary romance books. And Tara has a fun fact. Oh yeah, so Darcy goes to a lot, she's going to talk about writing conferences in this interview, and um, I've met her at a bunch of conferences, but like little fun fact, I met her at Romantic Times RT in Reno, which actually turned out to be the last RT, so I was very happy that I got to go there. And Darcy, being a good old pal, uh, (laughs) snuck me into uh, a photo shoot with some uh, topless cover models. Whoa. Yeah. Is there a shower involved? Or how? Yeah, we got kicked out Whoa. before the shower. Yeah. There was too steamy? No, the... Mo- oh, you got your messages there. Whoops, so. whoops. The cover models were too shy. They oh. didn't want us looking. <laughs> <laughs> that's the sweetest thing I've heard. Well, that's great. Yeah, so Dark at Sea talked to us a bit about writing retreats, which I've always been interested in as being a non-writer. Yeah. They seem like fun. I know, it's like a holiday, but you're still working, but you're relaxed and also working. I don't... And you're with your friends. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to balance the working part. I just want to like hang out with my mates. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. Yeah. But yeah, writing retreats, we learned about how she refreshes her old backlist titles and a little bit about how she got her start in the indie world. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, Darcy's great. She's also a jewel of historical romance. So she's uh, one of the 12. She's got a lot of info mm-hmm. to give us. So please keep listening. So thank you, Darcy, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And so just before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am Darcy Burke, and I live in Oregon, and I write historical and contemporary romance. My historical romance is set in the UK, in England mostly, but also in Wales, and I'm trying to think of everything in Scotland, but we're we're moving to Scotland, and not, no, not me personally moving to Scotland, but. <laughs> Characters moving into Scotland in 2020. How's that? I love the we. You're just a <laughs> yeah, right, we, yeah. happy family. Me and my characters are like a thing and they're real. And set during the Regency. And then I have uh, contemporary novels that are set here in Oregon wine country. It doesn't necessarily mean they're books about wineries. Um, one trilogy is, but actually the main series is a family saga and they own brew pubs so they're actually beer makers not wine makers which I thought was kind of funny because it's wine country but they make beer. <laughs> We're, Oregon's really known for beer too so that's uh, important I guess which is funny because I've been a wine lover much longer than I was a beer lover. I believe really started to like beer in the last few years. My husband has always loved beer and he's super excited that now I, I like beer. I like dark beer and now he has a gluten intolerance so he can't really oh, drink no. beer. <laughs> Sad trombone. Oh, so you just switched places. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, yes, I live and work here. And I had just, my assistant was just here, the banana cat. And (laughs) I have three other cats and two kids. And it is a lovely chaos. Oh, that sounds very nice and chaotic. (laughs) We want to learn a little bit more about your writing career. So were you traditionally published first or did you always self-publish yourself? No, I was a tradition self-published first. So I was writing just historical uh, romance. That's my first love, and that's what I was writing. And then the self-publishing boom sort of took off. And and I've been agented since like 2008, I think. I was a finalist in the um, Romance Writers of America Golden Heart Contest, which was a contest for unpublished authors. I say was because last year was the last year. It's a little sad as times change. So I was a Golden Heart finalist uh, with a historical novel and sort of had the misfortune to be um, trying to break out into traditional publishing um, when the Great Recession hit, which I literally went on submission to New York with my first book that I published um, independently, Her Wicked Ways, like the week the market crashed in like September of 2008. So that was super fun. 
didn't work, really work out so well. <laughs> so um, I decided to take advantage of, of independent publishing when a couple of friends of mine, um, notably uh, Courtney Milan, who's a good friend of mine, she was like, Darcy, you should try this. You have like three books that are done and that they're a great series. And so I said, okay. And so she held my hand a little bit. And uh, in 2012, that's what I did. And then about a year and a half later, I do a writing retreat every year with some women that finaled in the Golden Heart contest together. Um, we just became really good friends and we still retreat to this day every year. And that particular year, we were up in Seattle, in the Seattle area. It was January. We'd had like a gas leak or a gas smell in the main house and I was staying in the guest house. Uh, it was me and two other authors, Rachel Grant and Courtney Milan. It was really cold uh, because they turned the gas off to that house and so we had no heat that night. And here we are in January, dead of winter, it's freezing. I don't think I've ever been so cold in my life and that includes camping on, you know, on a mountain in the cold. I came up with this idea for a contemporary series and it was just fully formed like I was going to write these sex couplets and one of them died and and there's a seventh kid and there it's anyway the whole thing just was there because that's what one does when you're cold and you can't sleep <laughs> and so I hear I'd never really thought about writing outside of the historical genre but that's what I did and so I I wrote sort of a prequel like Christmas time novella for that series and then my agent sold the series to Avon so I was independently published and then traditionally published. And now I'm currently just independently published. But I loved uh, working with Avon specifically. I loved my editor and not to say I wouldn't do that again. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference now, do you think, between self-publishing you know, and traditionally? I don't know that I have a preference. There are pros and cons to both. I really liked working with my editor. We just got on really well. And she taught me a lot and really helped me as a writer. I think that I'm a much more successful independent author now because of that experience. I love, I don't know, some of the things that, that I love so much about independent publishing, you know, Avon was really great about, you know, they would really let me have input on covers and the titles were all mine. So the last book, I couldn't come up with the title and they came up with it and it was fine and I was totally happy with it. So that was great. So it's nice to have, when you get to those moments where you, your brain is dead and you have nothing else, to have collaborators to help you with that is <laughs> nice. And that's what other, you know, I have a lot of indie author friends that, that do that for me and I do that for them. So it's hard to say if I have a preference. There's just, there's pros and cons to both for sure. Definitely. Yeah, I guess that's why the indie community is such a tight knit one. That, that That's just dawned on me as you're talking that it's, it is having one another to rely on because you don't really have the support of the bigger kind of publishing entity, you know? Yes, yes. There's a lot of different groups that have formed, you know, so I, you know, some of us are just historical authors and so we promote together or whatever. And then, you know, you form friendships, friendships with people and you end up sort of working together on maybe goals and planning or, you know, basic stuff like what's working at, this vendor, what kind of promotions working for you? What's the best way to run an arc team? All that sort of thing. And I think when you're independently published, it really forces you to think about everything because even when you're traditionally published, there's a lot you still have to do marketing wise. And I think that's been true for even before the, the independent publishing boom. And so as an indie author, I feel like I've, I've learned to do that really well to balance that because it, you know, it would be nice to just be a writer all the time and just be that part of my brain. But working in India has forced me to use the other part of my brain. And I really like the whole, I like, you know, packaging books and series and branding and figuring out like how to launch something and that kind of stuff. I just, I really enjoy. How did you find your like indie author tribe, I want to say? Several ways. So once upon a time, way back when, I joined like this Yahoo writing loop. <laughs> and I met a few people. I'm definitely there. imagining you with a, a plug-in internet cord. <laughs> I don't think I've used your Yahoo. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Making so, fun of Yahoo, not you. <laughs> yeah. So, and so, yes. So I met a group of people that way. And one of them is still writing and it's like one of my best friends. That's Erica Ridley. And so we've been friends forever. 
back before we were, we were just baby writers. And then when I finaled in the Golden Heart, that was a huge, not just a networking opportunity, but just it really bonded you together. I mean, right when, in those days, right when they would announce the Golden Heart finalists in March, you would form a Yahoo loop of your group and you would come up with a name. We were the, um, we were the pixie chicks because we, at the time people were getting agents and getting deals and going out on submissions. And we were always sprinkling pixie dust. I don't really know where that came from. And so we became the pixie chicks. And so everybody has all the different golden heart groups have names. It's just kind of cute. So a bunch of those ladies I've become very close friends with, and I still talk to pretty much on a daily basis, like Rachel Grant, for instance. And we don't even write in the same genre, but it doesn't matter. We share all sorts of information and are just supportive. And we're good personal friends now too, right? I liken it to, you know, when you work in a job, like you guys are probably, you know, friendly outside of work in addition to being, you know, coworkers because gosh, you spend so much time. Was Steph and I actually people. really dislike each other. Yeah, and I was like, I hate your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I've no, exposed I, a, a terrible secret at Como. <laughs> <laughs> Toxic work in my yeah. no, You're only my boss, you know? <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I totally get what you mean. I feel like, especially like when I moved to Canada as, a, you know, an Irish person that didn't really know anyone here, and then you get to work at Kobo, and you're like, oh, these people like all like books like I do. Like, it's just automatic friends. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really important as writers, we have to sometimes go out of our way to do that because we don't, you know, my coworker is Banana Cat, and sometimes <laughs> she's not really helpful when I need to bounce an idea off of someone. And so if you don't form those connections, you don't really have like coworkers. And I guess some people can work like that, but I cannot, I need to be able to say, Hey, read this for me. Or is this stupid? Or like, I have an idea for a a story I want to write this year, but it has a little bit of a sad aspect to it. And I need to make sure that it's not like too sad or whatever. And so I'll bounce that off a couple of writer pals and see what they think. Nice. Sounds like you have a really good, um, solid, tribe to steal Steph's word. I do, I do. Yeah, in fact, one of them, so I, I went to a retreat, these writing retreats are great, you meet all sorts of people. Um, a good friend and I who lives here in Oregon, she's an author, we went to a retreat where we didn't, I didn't really know anybody, I knew a couple of people, and we met this other couple of gals who were like BFFs from forever ago. And so the four of us like became really close. And one of them just sent us, she sent us all these little mugs and it's us sitting on a pier and it's our backs. And she got our hair perfect. Like everybody <laughs> exactly the way it should from the back. And it's just the sweetest thing. Oh, that's really cute. So are writer retreats open to anyone? It depends. It depends. You know, mm-hmm. the, this one I'm talking about in particular, usually it's somebody who says, okay, I want to get some people together and do a retreat. And so like this one was an author who just rented a big house. There was room for like 12. She booked a caterer to like, so we didn't have to cook. Wow. And then it was like, okay, it's this, this much money, you know, and then they invite their group of people, you know, their tribe. And if they have more space, maybe people in their tribe have other people in their tribe and they invite them. Right. I mean, it's sort of like a word of mouth thing. And it also depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, you know, if it's a writing retreat where everybody's like head down writing, but you get together at meals and stuff, that's one thing. Or like I went to a retreat a couple of weeks ago that was more like everybody shared ideas and we had a list of topics that we wanted to discuss over the couple of days. And, and then we would take notes and people who had something to say about that could talk and people that had questions and it was all very informative and we weren't writing. So there's, you know, it just sort of depends on what the focus is. Mm-hmm. So, that makes sense. I yeah. think that somebody could probably have a pretty darn good business planning and executing writing retreats for people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steph, side hustle. Let's Maybe that should be my side job, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let me know if you do. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I totally will. <laughs> So I'm sure that you will probably use uh, social media a lot to interact with your different author friends, like different groups. So do you have a favorite platform? None of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a favorite platform just because I definitely see that social media can, it can be a time suck because I, I mostly am on Facebook because that's where most of my readers are. And I'm also on Instagram, Twitter less so because I find Twitter to be, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole that has nothing to do with my job. And so that's not super helpful during the day necessarily. Um, and also Twitter is just by, by nature somewhat snarky and I can only do so much of that because 
I just can only do so much of that. Um, and so on Facebook, a lot of these things I'm talking about with your writing career, like collaborating with people and sharing ideas and information and just learning and keeping up to speed on the changing industry. You know, there's so many Facebook groups that cover all these different things that I like to check in with on a regular basis. And then probably actually my favorite place to go is I have a writer group. Actually, I have two writer groups, one for each of my genres. I have Darcy's Duchesses for um, my historical readers and then Brooks Book Lovers for my contemporary readers. And I love going there because it's they're my super fans, basically. And we like to talk about my books, but also what's going on. You know, we celebrate birthdays. I do um, a Facebook Live every couple of weeks in there. I just did one last night. And I answer questions and I let people know what I'm working on and what's coming up. And Banana Cat usually tries to steal the spotlight. So that's fun. She was really funny. For a long time, when I first started doing that, she was always like in the frame, like, oh, everybody, everybody was always like, where's Banana? And then she kind of like took a step back for a while, but now she seems to be kind of inserting herself back in. So I'm not sure what happened there. She got like a little camera shy for a while. But so I really, I, that's probably my favorite place to go. And then I also have a, like a private group of just of like my super, super fans who read advanced copies of my book. And, and that's kind of like where people get like the really inside information. And whenever I share a cover for the first time or a, a book blurb for the first time or some sort of reveal, I always share it with that group first and then with my reader groups and then with everybody else. Do you find it difficult to balance the contemporary and historical, like having them as separate entities or do you find that it's just uh, works best for your readers? It's difficult a little bit because some people cross over and read both, but a lot don't. And I've been writing a lot more in the historical genre than the contemporary genre, surely because I was writing a historical series and it took off. And so I just focused my energy there. And I still love writing contemporary, but it's, I'll admit, it's a little harder to stay engaged when I, if I'm not having a book out very often. But we do still try to stay, I say we, because I have an assistant who helps me with social media. And so... Other, um, other than Banana Cat? Yes, yes. I have an assistant named Jill. She's lovely. <laughs> she, um, it's actually really fun. She's, um, her mom owned my local bookstore where, um, where I used to buy all my romance novels in high school. Oh. <laughs> She did. She wasn't the owner then, but she bought it later. And so, and then her mom retired last year. And so Jill was kind of thinking about maybe taking out a job as an author assistant and asked me if I knew anybody that was hiring. And I said, actually, (laughs) and she had done marketing in her past life and for a bookstore and whatnot. And she lives here locally. So it's great. Um, A lot of, you know, authors have virtual assistants that could be anywhere. I love that we can get together and have lunch and like we're doing um, holiday cards for um, my readers this year. And so she ordered them and brought them over to my house last week and I signed them all and that was fun. So yeah, Jill is sort of my team when it comes to um, like the day to day and making sure I can write words and she can help me with some of the heavy lifting. And she's instrumental. Like, like I, I, I don't know. She's made herself, I, t- I told her this the other day, I said, you've made yourself quite um, indispensable. And she said, good, that means I'm doing my job. <laughs> You write with the same name for both different genres. What was the decision behind doing that? Was it just because you bounced between writing one series and another? Or was it you're just like, this is my name? I think it was just like, this is my name. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, you know, it's a good name. It's it's a really good name for Regency because my name is Darcy. But, Mm -hmm. uh, and I was not named after Pride and Prejudice, even though my middle name is Elizabeth. Whoa. Whoa. Luke, I know. Uh, my mom just likes the name Darcy. She wasn't a Pride and Prejudice fan either. Although she, my mom was born in England. So when she was in high school, she was cast as a maid. I think she was very shy, but they really wanted her to be in the play because her, she still had a British accent at the time and they were doing Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I think that's funny, <laughs> but I don't think that's where she got the name Darcy. I don't know where she got it. And then Elizabeth is a family name. So it was that, or if my, if I was a boy, my name would have been Lothar von Wolfgang. So. Wow. Quite the name. <laughs> right. It was a, my parents had a thing where my mom would name the girls and my dad would name the boys and they'd already had my brother and he was named after my dad. And my mom really wanted a girl and, and my dad, I think really wanted a girl. And so he just kind of said, you know, well, if you have a boy, it's going to be Lothar von Wolfgang. So <laughs> like, All right. The girl then. <laughs> the universe was listening. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think there were, I didn't really have any, um, and maybe I should have had some more forethought about my name, but I just, 
Darcy Burke is a good name and it, it looks good on a cover because it's each name has five letters so it's balanced and yeah. Do you approach marketing differently between the two genres or do you kind of have the same plan for both? Pretty much the same. It's a little bit different because most of my contemporary catalog is not like I can't, I don't control it because, because they were published by a publisher. And so we just kind of work together. Like we're just, we're just uh, recording audio for those books. We just sold the audio rights, which is exciting. And so I want to try to, we're, we're going to be doing some marketing um, with that series, hopefully next month. It's a great series. And I, um, and there's, you know, 10 books. So lots, lots of people to read. And if people like small town, but sexy, family saga then that's that's for them nice i do like them yeah. <laughs> yeah, can confirm readers like it yeah <laughs> uh, you have a really massive backlist in your marketing plan do you have older titles that you promote or is there a specific focus that you take in um kind of when you're planning out your year yes and no because i haven't necessarily done a great job of it as i've been producing front list but um it's funny you ask this because I was just having a conversation this morning. If there was a new Facebook group that arose today about how we do um, promoting backlist. And this came from a conference that we, that I was at a few weeks ago that I think you were at too. So yeah. talking about promoting backlist and how best to do that, because it's a little bit of a different animal, right? If you've got a, a series that's done and how you promote that, because I mean, I know for me, I haven't reached all the readers. It's not, you know, it's not tired. It's, it's, and especially when you're writing historicals, those books are evergreen, really. I mean, they don't, you don't have to worry about updating technology or lingo or anything. They are what they are because it's historical, right? And so um, I do have some specific ideas in 2020 about how I'm going to market some of, um, some of my earlier series. And, um, and I'm really excited about it because, and I learned a lot at this, it was a um, conference I went to called Romance Author Mastermind. And so a bunch of um, masters of the romance genre sharing best practices. And so um, there'll be some new content for some of my older series to sort of, you know, point people in the right, in that direction and refresh it a little bit. I've rebranded series, like I've put new covers on um, a couple of series. When I just did a year ago, they'd been out for over five years. And so I thought, you know, let's put a, um, a fresh stamp on it. And they turned out really great. And then I had another series. Um, I have this series of four books called Legendary Rogues. And it's sort of Indiana Jones in the Regency um, with some King Arthur legend thrown in. It's like a secret society trying to protect all the Arthurian artifacts that are actually real. And, um, and then it's very Indiana Jones as far as, you know, the, the books are, you know, protecting the artifacts, finding the artifacts. It's a little bit of Da Vinci code thrown in as they do a kind of a treasure hunt. And I love those books and they're, but they're very, um, because they are, have more of an action adventure vibe to them. They don't necessarily fit into when you think of some people, when they think of a Regency novel, they think of just think of a ballroom. Mm -hmm. and so I have to market that a little bit differently. And so I started with sort of market branding it one way and then I changed it and I'm still thinking if, if I've quite hit on the right, on the right branding for it, but we'll see. Do your it's, reader groups help you with kind of deciding what branding to go down or is that something that you kind of do yourself? I will work with um, designers and some marketing folks and my little author tribe. Um, I do sometimes run stuff by my reader group you know, do you, which one of these do you like better? And I'll ask them different kinds of questions. Like I was just writing a, um, a holiday short story that I'm going to be sending out in my newsletter next week. And so I asked them, you know, which character in the series do you, which couple do you want to hear about? And like, there was an overwhelming winner. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll write about them. <laughs> so, so I do love to get their input sometimes. Yeah. I was just wondering, where do you see the like self-publishing industry going in the next couple of years? Not to ask you a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know, it's hard to say. It's, I think that, I think there's sort of like two diversions and I, you know, there's a certain vendor out there that we won't name that people really tie themselves to and they're just, they're all in or whatever. And that's not me. 
I see so many opportunities for indie authors in ebook, in audiobook, in translating your books, in just lots of ways of getting, you know, good quality work into readers' hands. And I think that's important. You know, it's really important to me. I, you know, hire professional designers, editors, marketing folks, you know, really try to put out the best product for my readers because, you know, we have a little bit of a contract here, right? I'm going to write you a really great book and you're going to buy them all. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so I think that's important. I think it's going to be important for at least for me, the way I see my business and how I want to grow is looking at the total picture of how can I deliver books to the most people in the best and easiest ways and how can I work with, you know, my partners in the industry to do that. Yeah, I think so you really you, a weird woo woo answer, but <laughs> no, no, that's great. You really covered it's it's you know we often get questions about why authors should be publishing wide, um, and yeah, these are all the reasons why. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's one of the things I actually credit my agent with a little bit. We talked early on. He was always very supportive of me uh, publishing independently, and and still is. And, you know, he would just say from go, why would you not want to be wide? No, you have to be wide. I mean, it wasn't a question for me, but I think that sometimes people don't understand what that can mean. And and it, it, it does take more effort, you know, I mean, it's what works at one vendor doesn't necessarily work at another vendor. You know, I have fantastic success with box sets at Kobo and I love it. And I love figuring out ways where I can use that to expand. And that's one of the things I want to focus on in 2020 is really trying to figure out, because I think that there's a strength everywhere and it's up to us. If we want to be successful, you have to focus on that strength and make it work. Okay, so that's very good advice. I have another hard question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you think has been the best thing that you've done for your writing business? The best thing that I've done for my writing business. Your questions are Um, too hard. Can't be helped. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe hire Jill, my assistant. I don't know. (laughs) But um, actually, probably the best thing that I have done for my writing business is um, to really let my passion for writing drive me. I think that a lot of people, you know, you get all sorts of advice in this industry, right? And there's a lot to be said for following your gut, but you also have to temper that with some brain. And that's part of being an entrepreneur, right? Being, um, being a successful independent author is knowing what you want to write versus what you should write and finding what meets both those things. And so for me, I made a conscious decision to pursue Um, some ideas that I thought would be really marketable, but that I was really passionate about writing. And that is when I think the magic happens. Nice. That's when you get your pixie dust. Yes, that is, yes, that is where it comes from. (laughs) So what are you working on next? And what can readers expect from you next? It may or may not be the same thing. Depends. (laughs) (laughs) I know what they're expecting from me. No. (laughs) Um, So I am currently in the middle of writing it's the continuation of my um, historical series, The Untouchables, which has 12 books. And then I continue the series with what's called the Spitfire Society. And right now I have three books planned. The first book came out in August and the next one will be out in February. So I sort of, The Untouchables was about the, these untouchable heroes, right? That were like, you know, the upper echelon of society that these, you know, blue stockings and wallflowers couldn't possibly hope to to touch. So that's why they're the untouchables. And then sort of the next iteration are the Spitfire Society, which are the women who have decided, you know what, I've had it with society and this nonsense, and I don't want to look for a husband. I'm not going to find a husband and I don't care. And I'm going to be awesome on my own, which is not necessarily what would have happened in large amounts in the Regency but I am writing for a 21st century audience and it's not that those women didn't exist. And so I thought it would be fun to explore that sort of from that focus still with untouchable heroes. Cause you know, and so that's what I'm writing now. And uh, the next book is called a Duke is never enough. 
and that'll be out in February and it's a lot of fun. And then I'll write another book that'll be out in June. And then, like I said earlier, I have some um, content that I'll be doing with some other series with the untouchables and with um, my first series secrets and scandals. And then I just, I just did a, a Christmas trilogy of books. It was a family saga based on like Christmas stories. Like there was um, a Christmas Carol and the gift of the Magi and yes, Rudolph the red nosed reindeer. <laughs> I managed to make that into a romance novel. That was fun. <laughs> and so, and that people have really responded to that. So I'll probably do another book or two in that series in a year from now for next Christmas. And then I have, I'm trying to decide between two series that I'm going to launch um, either later in 2020 or at the start of 2021, which seems like a long way off, but in publishing, it's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you're going to be very busy. Are you, do you have any time for writing retreats next year too? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I guess you're writing there, so it's it is your job. <laughs> well, I'm gonna take one for the team and go to Florida next month to meet oh. up with pal. So you know, that's that'll be a real hardship. <laughs> and then I'll do my annual retreat this spring with my pixies. Okay. And then yeah, there'll be plenty of I think writing get-togethers. I get to go to Scotland in June for the reader author. No, no romance author reader event. I always get that mixed up. It's called Rare and uh, it's a big book signing in Edinburgh at the end of June and so I'm looking forward to that. Oh awesome. You could get plenty of uh, inspiration from being there directly. I actually am going to be doing some research there because one of the series that I am researching to write is at least one of the books if not two are set in Scotland. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anything else to add? I think we covered everything. No, I don't think so. This has been super fun. Stephanie, I need to meet you in person. Um, Mm -hmm. When's that going to happen? I don't know. They got to send me to some nice locations. I'm looking at you. (laughs) (laughs) We'll we'll figure something out. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, you'll have to let us know if you ever come up to Toronto. Um, If not, I'll just send Steph to your door. You know, I really want to come to Toronto. I have never been, and it is on my list of cities that I absolutely have to visit. So, yes. Oh, well, you can't come without telling us you have of to course tell not. Us so we can and it can't run. be in the winter <laughs> wouldn't fair recommend enough. no <laughs> fair enough oh well thanks so much darcy it was great chatting to you it was great chatting with you too thanks you both so much Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for Darcy's title, there will be a link to them on our blog. Or if you're interested in learning how to grow yourselves, visit KoboWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Tara Kremen, Stephanie McGraw, and edited by Kelly Robotham. Music was by Tearjerker. And thanks, Darcy, for the interview. It was really great. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at Kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.